Hello and welcome to the Chingsi Sports Presents the Premier League Show powered by Chingsi Media. We are back again for episode 30. You know what I mean? Find us on all digital streaming platforms, most notably Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Check out the links in the description and the pinned tweet. We are now officially in the running, the title running, the relegation running, the battle for mid-table. Qualifying for Europe. It looks like the next few months are going to be a roller coaster. So put your seatbelt in. Put your seatbelt on, should I say. With the final international break of the season to punctuate the final two months, it will be interesting to see if there are any major injuries to key players ahead of the many, many big games that are still to be played. Plus the added caveat of Champions League football, where we have three unbelievable ties, arguably four, as Real Madrid take on Manchester City, Arsenal take on Bayern Munich and PSG take on Barcelona. Now, without any further ado, we go straight into last week's fixtures, which feel like an age ago. The first of which was at Old Trafford in the match between Manchester United and Everton, which ended 2-0 to the Red Devils. A pair of penalties put pay to Everton's profligacy in front of goal, leaving them perilously perilously poised above the drop zone in 16th, a mere four points clear of 18th place Luton. This result was their fifth straight defeat against Manchester United, a side that they've only beaten once in their last 15 games dating back to 2019. And they'll have to wait until next season for an opportunity to change that woeful record. United took the lead after Alejandro Garnacho, who scored what will almost certainly be the goal of the season, with an acrobatic overhead kick against Everton earlier on in the season, was felled by James Tarkovsky and Manchester United's divisive captain, Bruno Fernandes, stepped up and opened the scoring from the spot. For United's second goal, which was also from the spot, Marcus Rashford, who received an England call-up this week, stepped up to send England number one, Jordan Pickford, the wrong way to secure the three points for United, which keeps their faint hopes of a Champions League finish alive. An acne-ridden performance from Manchester United. Right. Um, the next game was at the Molyneux. Incidentally, Wolves are playing there now as we speak in the Midlands derby between Wolves and Coventry. <coughs> this one was Wolves against Fulham, which ended 2-1 to Wolves. Wolves did well to topple an informed Fulham side inspired by former Arsenal midfielder Alexander Iwobi in the absence of former Arsenal midfielder Willian. With Marco Silva's side coming into this game on the back of two consecutive morale-boosting wins against Manchester United and Brighton respectively, they would have fancied their chances of getting at least something from the Molyneux, which has been a fortress for Wolves this season. Wolves, who were missing a few of their stars, namely Matthias Cunha and Huang Hee Chang, started academy graduate Nathan Fraser who dons the number 63 shirt number up top. They also lost star player Pedro Neto and all three um, missed today's fixture against Coventry, none of which are, on the st- are in the starting lineup or on the bench. Um, in spite of this, the so-called medical upheaval, if you like, 22-year-old Algeria fullback Ryan Ait Nori, or Ait Nori, should I say, opened the scoring after a pullback from Neto's replacement, Totti Gomez. The nature of Wolves' second goal from former Barcelona right-back Nelson Semedo will surely irk Fulham manager Marco Silva as his tame effort came off of Fulham captain Tom Kearney's fight to wrong foot burnt Leno in the Fulham goal. In the words of Jeff Beck, hi-ho silver lining, an added time goal from the impressive Alexander Iwobi proved to be a mere consolation, but ensured that I got my first correct score of the weekend. Okay, following that game was at Sohas Park in a game between Crystal Palace and Luton Town that ended one apiece. 
Crystal Palace took on a Luton Town side on the back of five consecutive defeats in all competitions and were missing various key players such as Omari Bell, Elijah Adebayo, Jacob Brown and Albert Sambi Lokonga. Um, Palace took the lead after a hospital back pass from Alfie Doughty, a player who has impressed me a lot this season and I mentioned a lot in previous podcasts. Especially with the quality of his delivery from crosses and set pieces. Um, yeah, so he allowed right back Daniel Munoz, um, January signing from Belgian side Genk, to gift Jean Philippe Mateta a tap in, although I felt he did finish it with a plum. Luton seemed to be the architects of their own downfall, especially in the opening half, an hour or so of the match, with Jordan Clark's hospital pass. Teeing up Mateta, but this time the six foot four France born forward failed to hit the back of the net. Palace, who in the second half seemed to do everything but score, with Eze almost scoring from the halfway line after spotting Luton stopper Thomas Kaminsky off of his line. Edson Odua also hit the crossbar in the dying embers of the match, in which Luton managed to grab themselves a dramatically unlikely point from the depths of despair, and not for the first time this season. Luton's veteran former Palace winger, Andros Townsend, rolled back the years with an inviting in-swinging cross into the Palace area, which only required the subtlest of flick-ons from Corley Woodrow for it to nestle into the back of the net and grab a point for the Hatters, who kept, or should I say keep, their survival hopes well and truly alive, ahead of their game in hand against Bournemouth, which I'll talk about later on in the show. Speaking of Bournemouth, they took on bottom of the table Sheffield United in a match that ended 2-2 at the Vitality Stadium. If I would have told you that mid-table Bolton would have a 15th minute penalty at home to a Sheffield United side who were coming off the back of a 6-0 home drubbing, having lost the previous three games without scoring, you would have been forgiven for thinking that this match would be a routine and comprehensive home win for Bournemouth. It was anything but that. Things started to go wrong for the Cherries when Dominic Solanke missed the penalty after he was fouled by Blades midfielder Tom Davies. In one of the worst penalties you'll ever see, Solanke, who missed out on an England call-up this week, slipped and ballooned the ball over the bar. I think personally, Ivan Tony's comeback from injury or scoring comeback from injury is probably the main factor in Solanke missing out on the squad. Brazilians, Brazilian midfielder Gustavo Hammer or Hamer later opened the scoring against the run of play after Jaden Bogle, who has generally been very good this season from right back, had his shot parried into Hamer's path. In a similar situation, Bournemouth captain, their goalkeeper Neto, parried a Hamer corner into the back of Dominic Solanke as the, brawl, as the ball broke into the path of Sheffield United captain Jack Robinson, who didn't need to be asked twice to put the ball in the back of the net. With Sheffield United now two up with just 25 minutes to go, against the Bournemouth side clearly having an off day, a coupon buster was surely on the cards. When Burkinab fullback Dango Tara headed in on Mark from a corner on the 75th minute, I just couldn't see how the Blades would survive what would prove to be an onslaught. However, it took until the 91st minute for Bournemouth to find an equaliser, as Sheffield United's failure to deal with yet another Bournemouth corner allowed Turkish striker Enes Unyal on loan from Hetafe to back his first Bournemouth goal as the game ended to a piece. So Sheffield United arrested a recent slump in form with a goal, with a, with a draw. So they obviously stopped a recent awful run of form, which has seen them lost numerous matches consecutively. Bournemouth, on the other hand, will be will be kicking themselves how they didn't beat Sheffield United, who were really on the ropes for most of that game. Okay, the 530 kickoff between Arsenal and Brentford ended 2-1 to the home side, with Arsenal knowing that only a win 
would take them to the top of the table and only a win would suffice. It was none other than their summer signing Declan Rice, cool as ice, who headed in a fabulous cross from Benjamin White. Arsenal were cruising into a half-time lead until Aaron Ramsdale, who was back in the side to face Brentford for the third time this season, in place of Arsenal's online stopper, on loan stopper from Brentford, David Raya. Ramsdale made a hideous attempt to play in Ben White, despite William Saliba being an unmarked, more viable option. Allowed Brentford's French-born Congolese striker, Johan Visser, to intercept as the ball trickled into the back of the net. Visser looked visibly embarrassed with his goal, but took it nevertheless. In the fourth minute of first half at a time, a similar mistake at a similar stage of the last season against Southampton shows that Ramsdale lapses of concentration are unfortunately still a part of his game. In the second half, however, he did make two excellent saves from Ivan Tony and Nathan Collins, which some may argue was atonement for his first half aberration. Surely Arsenal's seven-game winning streak wasn't going to come to an end against Brentford at home like this, especially with one or both of Manchester City and Liverpool bound to drop points during their face-off. It looked as though that was going to be the case and that Arsenal fans would have to endure the accusation of being bottlers once again. However, in the 86th minute, Kai Havertz, who scored the winner for Arsenal, in the match at the GTEC Stadium earlier on in the season, rose like a salmon to head in a Ben White cross after fabulous link-up play between White and Martin Odegaard, two players who have been instrumental, arguably the most instrumental, in Arsenal's eight-game winning streak and reinvigorated title charge. This win saw Arsenal climb to the top of the table in anticipation of Sunday's clash between Liverpool and Manchester City at Anfield. Okay, into the Sunday clashes, starting at Villa Park, we had the game between Aston Villa and Tottenham Hotspur, which ended 4-0 to Tottenham. In a match which promised much, Tottenham put Villa to the sword with a scintillating second-half display courtesy of winning any game of football. They simply gave Unai Emery's side a footballing lesson. After the first half ended 0-0, James Madison guided in a superb right-wing cross from Pape Matassar, a player not exactly renowned for his delivery. Three minutes later, a poor pass from Ezri Konsa, who was called up for the England squad this week, was cut out by Dejan Kulisevsky, who fed Son, who made the most of what was now a 3v1 situation. Son's finely weighted pass to Brennan Johnson allowed the Welshman to open his body up and curl the ball beyond Emiliano Martinez in the Villa goal. 2-0, just like that. 12 minutes later, Villa captain John McGinn completely and utterly lost his head. The midfielder saw red in more ways than one in an action symptomatic of the ensuing Villa implosion. After the Scott ransacked Destiny Odoji, it was inevitable that he would receive his marching orders from the ref. Two further added time goals from Spurs captain Hongmin Son and Timo Werner completed the route as the game ended 4-0 to Tottenham. <coughs> so Tottenham gained a morale boosting season defining win against Aston Villa, which saw their Villa's um, lead a ahead of Tottenham cut to just two points. And Spurs have a game in hand against arch-rivals Chelsea for the chance to usurp Villa into fourth place. OK, the next game on Sunday was the Claret Derby, if you like. Claret and Blue Derby between West Ham and Burnley ended two apiece. An 11th minute David Datro Fofana Thunderbolt went some way to arrest in four consecutive Premier League defeats for Burnley with the last three of them being scoreless at that. Burnley doubled their lead on a stroke of half-time after West Ham defender Konstantinos Mavropanos headed a Josh Collin cross into his own net as West Ham went into the break two down, with their two-match winning streak under severe threat. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall at half-time in David Moyes' West Ham dressing room. He clearly wasn't enamoured or impressed, with the midfield as James Ward-Prowse 
and Calvin Phillips were both hooked at half-time for, Ma for Mikel Antonio and Edson Alvarez. Just a minute or so into the second half, Brazilian midfielder Lucas Pequetua halved the deficit after the ball broke to him just outside the Burnley box, as West Ham spent almost the entire second half peppering the Burnley goal. It took a former Burnley striker, Danny Ings, to get, get the equaliser on the 82nd after coming on as an 82nd minute substitute to finally break their resolve as the veteran forward grabbed an e injury time equaliser despite having an earlier effort in which he dinked Burnley goalkeeper James Trafford ruled out for, off for offside. The aforementioned Ings also hit the crossbar deep into added time in an effort which would have won the game for West Ham had it gone in. The next game between Brighton and Nottingham Forest ended 1-0 to the home side. Took an own goal from young Irish centre-half Andrew Omobamidele, former of Norwich City, to halt Brighton's three-match scoreless losing streak in all competitions. After a delicious delivery from Brighton's underrated German international Pascal Gross. See what I did there? Nottingham Forest goalkeeper Matt Sells, in for deposed former Arsenal stopper Matt Turner, parried the ball off an unaware Omobamidele's back as the ball trickled into the back of the net. In what was overall a poor game, bereft of much quality. Brighton moved up to 8th place, just 5 points away from 6th placed Manchester United. Okay, in the game of the week, and arguably the game of the season so far, we saw Liverpool take on Manchester City at Anfield in a game which ended one apiece, which was my second correct score of the weekend. In this decisive top of the table clash with which both sides went into in scintillating form, something had to give, especially as Arsenal had snatched top spot from Liverpool just the previous day. After John Stones guided home a corner from Kevin De Bruyne with a near post flick beyond Quivine Kelleher to put City one up. It looked as though City manager Pep Guardiola was finally going to banish his Anfield woes on his last league meeting against rival Jurgen Klopp. City, the better team in the first half, went into the game a goal to the good. Cue the trademark second half Anfield onslaught. It took just five minutes for the Reds to equalise after a diabolical back pass from Nathan Ake left City goalkeeper Edison short as he clobbered into Liverpool's inform Uruguayan centre forward Darwin Nunes. Up stepped the Argentine of Scottish heritage Alexis McAllister, who duly obliged and buried the ball beyond Brazilian Edison to equalise for Liverpool. 1 1 and game on. Second-half substitute Jeremy Doku hit the post late on for City and the same player can count himself fortunate to not have given away a dramatic late penalty after appearing to foul Alexis McAllister in the box with a high boot as the game ended 1-1. Right, Monday's fixture between Chelsea and Newcastle United ended 3-2 to the Blues. Chelsea, with this win against Newcastle, may still be in 11th, but their game in hand, albeit against Spurs, means that they're within a win off climbing to 8th place, which would leave them just 5 points off of 6th place Manchester United, having played the same amount of games. If Chelsea managed to finish 6th this season, that would cap off a remarkable turnaround for Maurizio Pochettino's side, especially considering they've spent most of this season in the bottom half of the table. They took the lead after a Cole Palmer strike took a deft flick off of Nicholas Jackson's boot to deceive Martin Dubravka. On a stroke of half-time, Newcastle equalised for a sublime strike from their mercurial Swede, Alexander Ishak. Another Cole Palmer strike, this time without a deflection, regained Chelsea's lead before Mikhailo Mudrik scored after showing a great poise and composure to round Dupravka. 
just five minutes after his introduction to give Chelsea a 3-1 lead and an unassailable two-goal cushion. It took a last-minute torpedo from Jacob Murphy to make it 3-2, but it turned out to be a mere consolation as Chelsea held out to win 3-2. Okay, the game between Bournemouth and Luton Town, which was on Wednesday, was a, a rescheduled match because of Luton captain Tom Lockyer's cardiac arrest in the original, or originally scheduled game. I truly believe that if Luton were to look back on their season, the only regrets that they'll have are this game and the Sheffield United game where they lost 3-1 at home. Luton raced to a 3-0 lead at half-time after goals from Tahif Chong, Chiodozi Ogbene and Ross Barkley. The incongruous diamond amongst the dirt, if you like, with all due respect to the rest of the Luton players after he beat the offside trap to smash in Luton's third goal as they went into the break, three goals to the good and looking as if they were going to climb out of the bottom three with a crucial three points. However... Bournemouth manager Andoni Iraola rang the changes at halftime and asked both Alex Scott and Luis Sinistera for Enes Unal and Marcus Tavernier at halftime as the Cherries were staring ignominy in the face. It took a brilliant and audacious piece of skill from Dom Solanke who turned and nutmegged Deiki Hashioko, Hashioka in one move before dinking the ball calmly beyond Thomas Kaminsky in the Luton goal. Next up was Ilya Zabani, whose header was adjusted to have crossed the line after a pinball session in the Luton box. 3-2. Once the score was 3-2, it was inevitable that Bournemouth were going to score another one and equalise, as they had both the momentum and the home crowd on their side, with over half an hour of football still to play. Just two minutes later, Bournemouth's play of the season elect, Antoine Semenyo, grabbed the first of his two goals after cutting in on Hashioka, who had a horror show of a match and was subsequently hooked off by Luton manager Rob Edwards before firing in past Kaminsky. 20 minutes later, Semenyo took advantage of the gaping holes in the Luton defence to bag the winner and the game's seventh in total to ultimately break Luton's heart and resolve and earn his side three points as Bournemouth continued their quest to finish inside the top 10. So that was that for last week's fixtures. Last week I managed to only get five correct scores, five correct results out of 11, with Manchester United beating Everton, Wolves beating Fulham, Arsenal beating Brentford, Liverpool drawing with Manchester City and Bournemouth beating Luton as well as the two correct scores I got, being Wolves winning 2-1 against Fulham and Liverpool drawing 1-0 with Manchester City. With this week only having four matches to predict, I hope I can get a clean sweep of both the correct scores and results. Here goes. The first match of this week is one of the two huge relegation six-pointers. And it sees... Vincent Company's Burnley take on Thomas Frank's Brentford. Burnley v Brentford. A whopping 12 points and four league positions separate these two sides. But if Company's side are to harbour any slim hopes of pulling off the greatest of all escapes, then they must pick up three points at home to Brentford. Burnley's form reads just one win in their last 15 matches in all competitions. Similarly, Brentford have just two wins from their last 16 games in all competitions. But you get the feeling that they'll welcome a draw if, it's, if it was on offer to them. As it keeps their head above water in a battle to avoid the drop. And so long as Luton and Nottingham Forest don't win, they will have enough leeway to not have to panic just yet. I think Brentford will just edge this one though. Because I think company side will attack Brentford. And take the game to Brentford, leaving spaces for the likes of the informed Johan Visser and Ivan Tony, who I think will score today to exploit. So my prediction's 2-1 to Brentford. In a match between Luton Town and Nottingham Forest, 
I feel it's getting really desperate for Luton now, and this is quite frankly a must not lose game for them. If Luton, who were free up against Bournemouth at half time on Wednesday and contrived to lose that match 4 3, beat Nottingham Forest today, they will actually leapfrog Forest into 17th place and out of the drop zone. However, if they lose at home to them, they will be six points adrift of them with only a handful of their 10 games remaining winnable on paper at least. Luton, like Forest, are in desperate form right now without a win in eight in all competitions. Forest have lost their last four games in all competitions and their last three of them have been 1-0. So they haven't scored in, in three games. That being said, I expect there to be a goal fest and a flurry of goals at either end of the pitch. And I've gone for a 2-2 Desmond. Right, with probably the game of the day at Craven Cottage in a match between Fulham and Tottenham Hotspur. With Fulham having already beaten Tottenham earlier on in the season, albeit on penalties in the Carabao Cup second round, a competition which represented Tottenham's best chance of silverware this season, and was incidentally the last trophy that they won back in 2008, Tottenham exacted their revenge with a routine 2-0 win at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium back in October. However, in actuality, Fulham have a horrendous record against Spurs with just two mere wins and a draw in 15 games spanning over 13 years. Of recent though, Fulham had managed to arrest their abysmal records against both Arsenal and Manchester United and have shown that on their day they can pull off an upset. Spurs are purring after they dispatched of Aston Villa with consummate ease last week and they go into this game knowing full well that a win would see them leapfrog Villa, who play tomorrow, into the top four with just 10 games left to play. With Mickey van der Ven ruled out through injury, Romania defender Radu Drag Dragosin will be tasked with trying to subdue Fulham's inform Rodrigo Muniz in what looks like being a tasty encounter. This match could go either way, but my prediction for this one is a shock 2-1 win to Fulham. Okay, in the last game of the week is another Claret and Blue derby between West Ham United and Aston Villa. Uh, with West Ham drawing unbeaten by Leverkusen in the Europa League quarterfinals, a team who have not lost a single game all season, they will be seen as huge underdogs and unlikely to persevere further in that competition, which brings greater emphasis on what they do in the league. I'm sure David Moyes' side will be targeting a top six stroke seven finish, something that I feel would be a remarkable feat for the football club. Europa League, Europa Conference League super favourite Aston Villa, who have drawn Lille, one of the better sides left in the competition, have had some up and down results for some while now but having assessed their results I think I've noticed a trend in their results they've been appalling against the better side since December last year in what was a remarkable week which saw them beat both Manchester City and Arsenal in a space of just three days since then their results have read two defeats to Manchester United they failed to beat Chelsea twice, including a defeat at home to them. They lost to Newcastle and Tottenham. However, they've sprinkled those results with wins against the also runs, so-called weaker teams, which indicates that they are flat-track bullies. Villa have already beaten a West Ham side this season, though. 4-1 back in October. A West Ham side that are now enjoying a return to form with three wins from five, including a 5 0 home drubbing of Bundesliga side Freiburg. But having said that, I think Villa will triumph in this one. I think they're going to beat West Ham 3-1. This episode was one of the shorter shows, as there were only four matches being played this week because of FA Cup football and the subsequent postponements. With next week being an international break, 
there will be no show until the following week on the 30th of March. But in the meantime, don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe. And be sure to use the upcoming break to catch up on all of the previous episodes. Toggle to the video section and check us out on Spotify. See you soon.